you have your notes, turn over to the first section there in your notes called an introduction to biblical counseling, and this is where we want to begin, an introduction to biblical counseling. Now, in order to help you with this, let me see if we can share with you a little bit how I got involved in biblical counseling, because when, sometimes when I share this story, it really helps people to understand why I say what I say about biblical counseling. You've got to understand that when I, several years ago, went to college, I was not focused on biblical counseling or teaching biblical counseling at all. I didn't even know what it was at that particular time. When I was in college, I took a lot of psychology courses. Later on, went to seminary. I went to seminary to learn how to preach. I took every counseling course they had at the seminary. Most of it was psychologically oriented, and, uh, but I wasn't even concerned about that. I just wanted to learn how to preach. That's all I wanted to do. And so, I started off taking all these courses in order to go out into a church and learn how to preach from the pulpit. Now, the first church that I went to be with staff on, I went as an associate pastor, and the senior pastor at that particular time uh, required everybody on staff to go to this other church to get training in biblical counseling. Now, you've got to understand, after four years of college and four years of seminary, one of the last things on the planet that I wanted to do was send in another class, all right? So I really had a bad attitude about this. And to make matters worse, it was a three-and-a-half-hour drive away, and it started at 9 o'clock in the morning, and it went all day until 10 o'clock at night, and then I had to drive home. So when you get tired this weekend, I want you to remember that, all right? <laughs> So it started at 9 o'clock in the morning, so I had to get up like 4 o'clock, get on the road, drive three and a half hours, start the class at 9 in the morning, and go until about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and all the way over, I can still remember that drive, all the way over to take that class. I was, I was actually pastoring in Ohio at that time, and this was a church in Indiana. So... Um, I was complaining and sinning all over the freeway. All right, it, it, it was terrible. And I finally arrived and sat down, kind of disgruntled, opened my notebook that they gave me, and I said, what are these guys going to teach me? After all, I just got out of seminary. And there's probably no one on the planet that's more dangerous than a guy straight out of seminary, all right? Because he believes he's got the whole world, you see, in his hands. But uh, not in God's hands, but in his hands. So, um, I started taking the class, and about the second day, by the way, this class went on for 12 weeks, okay? And it was Mondays for 12 weeks, Mondays for 12 weeks, and the second day of class, I had driven over again, all the way over, really unhappy about it. In the afternoon, I was asked to sit in on some counseling. And the guy who was the counselor was actually the pastor of the church there. His name was Dr. Bill Good. He, Bill became, a, later on, a very good friend of mine. God has since promoted him to heaven. But Bill had a counseling appointment, and he had asked me and another pastor in the class to sit in on this counseling appointment. I said, sure. Bill had never seen this couple before. And uh, so... Uh, Bill shared with us a little bit about what they had put down on a little introductory sheet, that the reason why they were coming to counseling. And uh, so we had prayer, and then he asked this couple to come into his office, and I was sitting at one side of the desk, and the other guy that was a part of this was sitting at the other end of the desk. And, um, and this elderly couple came in, very, very well-dressed. The man had a three-piece suit on. He had long sleeve white shirt with cufflinks and a nice tie, and she had a beautiful dress on. And, and, but you could tell as soon as they walked in, they did not look anybody in the eye. They looked at the floor. Something had, had happened, and it appeared to be devastating. And they sit down, sat down, and Bill had prayer with them. And he said, why have you come to counseling? And they kind of hemmed and hawed a little bit about it. And eventually... He said, well, the reason why we came to counseling was, and then he stopped. He said, you've got to understand that I live a good distance from here. I 
own a company. I have over 300 people that work for me in this company. I have been the chairman of the board of our church for almost 30 years. And I was arrested in a public park for flashing people. Now, I was sitting at the one end of the desk, and they tell you not to show any reaction to what the counselees have to say. <laughs> but I'm sure I look something like, <laughs> what? I'm trying to picture this old man in a big, long coat going into a public park in the middle of winter and flashing people. I'm going, oh. What would ever cause a guy to do that? And then they shared a few stories on how he was arrested for this. It drug his company through the mud. It drug his church through the mud. It drug his family name through the mud. They went from the pinnacle of respect in their community right down to being rejected and almost hated by everyone overnight. You could tell it's written all over her face. So I remember sitting there thinking to myself, okay, John, you've just had four years of psych classes in college. You've had four years of seminary. You should be able to help these people. And I didn't have a clue what I'd do. I didn't have a clue. I was so desperate, I kept thinking, now where would you go in the Bible to address this issue? And the only thing I could think of was David dancing naked before God. <laughs> and I wasn't sure how I was going to use that. <laughs> it would probably make matters worse. So I'm not going to use that text. And I was really, I'm seriously, I was sitting there with my Bible, thumbing to the concordance in the back, <laughs> looking for the word flashing. And obviously, it's not there. I didn't think it was, but just in case, I had missed it. Obviously, it wasn't there. And I saw Bill Good open his Bible and start addressing that man's heart and what would cause him to do that kind of thing, and at the same time, minister hope to that woman. And I thought, oh, my goodness. He knows what he's talking about. I had been taught a lot of great theology in seminary. When I graduated from seminary, I got the Hebrew award, and they wanted me to go on for my PhD in Hebrew, but I was more interested in going on into pastoral ministry. And so I knew Hebrew. I could parse Hebrew verbs. I could parse Greek verbs, and I could translate from the Old and New Testament, but I couldn't help people. And I realized I couldn't help people. I had had all these psych classes, and all I could think of was, maybe this guy's self-esteem is so low. It needs to be built up. I was all wrong. That's what I've been taught in my psych classes. But it was all wrong. And that night, three and a half hour trip home, I had a long, this time, confession time all the way home on the freeway. I got home and my wife had just recently gone to bed. The kids had kept her up late. She was already crawled into bed, kind of half asleep, and I came up to the side of the bed, knelt down next to her bed, and because of all my pride and arrogance, not wanting to take this class, I said, sweetheart, I'm a lousy husband, I'm a lousy father, I'm a lousy pastor, will you ever forgive me? I'll never forget, she rubbed her eyes, and she looked at me and she goes, I don't know what this class is doing, but I like it. <laughs> That's really what she said. So I was changed at that point. From that point on, I started reading everything I could get my hands on, which wasn't a whole lot back then. In the area of biblical counseling, I tried to drink up everything that these guys were teaching me from the Word of God. 
which now put handles on my Bible, real practical handles on my Bible to help people with serious problems. And you know you're among them in your church. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And so I was very dedicated from that particular point on to make sure that I knew how to not just dispense the Bible, but minister the Bible to people that were hurting, that needed help, that needed change. That's what I wanted to do. And by God's grace, wouldn't you know it, here, here's a guy who was really oriented towards preaching, and even to this day, I'll, I'll confess to you, I, I'd rather preach than counsel any day. Because preaching's easy. I mean, you can sit in your study all week, arrange things any way you want, you know, put it together and then present it. And rarely are you, are you ever going to have somebody stand up in the middle of a service and say, I object to that. But in counseling, that's going to be radically different. You're going to start dealing with people's pet sins. This is the way that they've been for years. And they're going to get mad at you. They're going to get upset. So preaching is much more fun. It's kind of the easy way of ministry. But when you start working with people in real life problems, it's different. So let's assume, this may be a huge assumption, you're ready to do that. Well, let's, what are we talking about here? What are we talking about in relationship to biblical counseling? I want to define it for you. And the first thing that I want to do is talk about what it's not before I talk about what it is. Let's clarify this thing. From this true story that I told you about my own life, I think it's pretty evident that biblical counseling really can be and a life-changing ministry for you as well as for your church. It revolutionizes your own life first, and that's what it did to me. You see, it had to impact me first. I had to see my own pride. I had to see my own arrogance. It's something that I think we all struggle with, and it's nothing that we always get conquered completely, but we continue to struggle with this as long as we are sinful human beings. But it, it, it's biblical counseling and learning how to use the Bible in very practical ways and the theology of the Bible in very practical ways that ends up changing us first before it really ends up changing other people. And I think when you get done with the three weekends that we are going to present here in the BCDA, that you're going to say, wow, I'm really a different person, and that's good, because it's the Word of God that's changed you. So as we begin here, what I want to do is to make sure that we're talking about the same thing, because there's an awful lot of ministries out there that claim to use biblical counseling. That's what they claim. And in our day, there are many definitions of what biblical counseling is. There shouldn't be, but there are many different views on what biblical counseling is. And of course, what is important is what the Bible says it is, right? What the Bible says it is. That becomes our authority. We're going to assume that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you have given yourself over to Him as His slave. We're going to assume that. But then beyond that, beyond that assumption, we're going to assume that you want to obey the Scripture, especially in this area, helping people. So, what biblical counseling is not, we're interested in that, what it is not. And the first thing that it's not, it's not an autonomous ministry. That's not what we're advocating. We're not advocating setting up some kind of freelance center for counseling. It's not an autonomous ministry that is somehow isolated from the local church or independent of the local church. 
Not at all. We don't find that in the New Testament at all. That's a secular view. We're not talking about setting up independent clinics around Southern California. That's not what we're talking about. That's the way secular people deal with it. That's even the way a lot of Christian people attempt to deal with it. They set up a clinic independent of the local church. No, it, the church is actually God's ordained instrument that He's chosen to use to really affect change in people's life for the preaching of the gospel and the advancement of His kingdom. So we're not talking about a freelance center. Because when you get something like that, then a lot of problems arise. For example, there's a lack of accountability in those independent centers. Who are they accountable to? Well, you may say, well, they're accountable to the state licensure. May I suggest to you that that actually makes them no longer credible? Because they have to sign off on that state licensure that they're going to teach the way the state tells them how to teach. That's a postmodern way. So you, if a Hindu comes in, you've got to, instead of converting that Hindu, you've got to counsel them on the basis of what a Hindu would accept as good counseling. If an atheist came in, you would need to do the same thing. To violate that would violate postmodern ideas of presenting... Um, counseling truths. The postmodernists would say there are no absolute truths. So there's a lack of accountability. There's doctrinal compromise. Who's going to oversee the type of counseling that's being given? Or sometimes there's financial compromise. Uh, a lot of money is given to independent clinics that first and foremost should be given to the church in order to advance the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, there's compromise. You heard about the psychologist who several years established a practice in his own neighborhood and his son grew up, went to college, got his degree in psychology, went on, got his master's degree, went on and got his doctorate degree and came home one summer and his father said, son, your mother and I have been working really hard for years. We're going to take off and take a three-month vacation. We're going to turn the entire clinic over to you and let you take it all for the next three months. Son said, that'd be great, Dad, no problem. So Dad and Mom went off, long trip to Europe, came back after three months, saw his son, said, son, how's it going? Great, practice is going great, clinic's going great. In fact, the son said... You know, Mrs. Jones lives about three blocks up the street from the clinic. Yeah, yeah. You've been seeing her for years. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know about her. Well, I cured her. You did what? I cured her. Oh, no, you didn't. She put you through college and grad school and Ph.D. You get the idea, right? When you have an independent clinic associated that's money-driven... There's the temptation. That's a temptation. We're not talking about counseling independent of the local church. It's because there's a lack of accountability, there's doctrinal compromise, there's financial compromise. Secondly, biblical counseling is not an activity reserved for experts. It's not an activity reserved for experts. Far too many have given counseling a Gnostic flavor. We're really advocating a model that any believer willing to be like a Berean that faithfully studies the Scripture can follow. Pastors can and should biblically counsel their flock. They should. They should be the models. Now, the Gnostic view, remember, it is the first century, first, second century church that had problems with Gnosticism. The whole Gnostic view is that we're in the know. We have a special field of knowledge not available to the average believer who only has the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Imagine that. Only has the Bible and the Holy Spirit. The two most powerful entities in the entire universe, the Bible and the Holy Spirit. But we're in the know. And unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians, including pastors, that have contributed to that kind of thinking. 
Now, being a biblical counselor, it requires work, it requires effort, it requires a careful study of the Word of God and a dependence upon God. As Colossians 1.29 says, there's a balance between a dependence upon God and our responsibility to labor. Paul says, I labor, striving according to His power, which so mightily works within me. Spurgeon said it like this, we must work as if it all depended upon us and pray as if it all depended upon God, right? And it does ultimately all depend upon God. You can't ultimately change anybody. Only God can. Only the truth of His Word of God can change. And this is the right balance for anyone who wants to do biblical counseling. If you're a Christian and you're equipped to give, um, you're equipped with the Word of God, then you are equipped to give biblical counsel. So we're not advocating something that somehow is independent of the local church. We're not advocating that at all. That's not our view. We're advocating something that's very much a part of the church. It's a central part of the very fellowship of a church. Which brings me to number three. Biblical counseling is not an optional ministry. It's not an optional ministry. It's not something where I think that I or my, me or my church can get involved in. Maybe not. I'm not sure. It's not an optional ministry. Because the New Testament doesn't present it like that at all. Grab your Bible, will you? Let's go over to Acts chapter 20. And we're interested in verse 20. If you've studied the book of Acts, you know that this is the Apostle Paul's farewell to the Ephesian church. And I think this is just uh, one model of what he did with most of the Gentile churches when he said farewell. But here we have an example of Paul saying farewell to the Ephesian church. Acts chapter 20, verse 20, he sets himself up an example. He knows he's not going to come back to the church, and so he says to them, listen, I want you to follow my example in the ministry. Do what I've done. This is what you need to do. And he instructs the elders to pick up right where he left, has left off. He's modeled it for them. They need to follow this particular model. So what does he say? He says in verse 20, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, or some have translated this, or in various private homes. Now, you'll notice that Paul presents his ministry in a twofold fashion. He, there was a public proclamation of the Word of God. That's the form of preaching. And there was the private proclamation of the Word of God that was counseling from house to house. Private, public. Proclamation of the Word of God. So, we've got to get back to an Acts 2020 vision of the ministry. Most of the time, the ministry of the Word of God is just viewed as a public ministry of the Word of God, not as a private ministry of the Word of God. In fact, look down at verse 31. He says in verse 31, Therefore, be on alert, he says to these elders, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Now, the word admonish is our Greek term, nuthetao. That's where we get our word nuthetic, or sometimes you'll hear nuthetic counseling. It means, um, it's... Nuthetao means to admonish, to warn, to counsel. It can mean any of those things, to instruct. But in this particular case, you notice who he instructed, not just groups. He says he instructed or he admonished, very deliberate Greek terminology here, each one. You see that? Each one. Paul spent three years in that church at Ephesus, going from house to house, 
counseling and admonishing everybody in that congregation. If there ever was a ministry that was neglected in the, in the church today, it's that kind of a ministry. Night and day for a period of three years. And he did it with tears. You see that? In other words, this was not some kind of detached, clinical, Skinnerian kind of counseling, white Coke approach. No, 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 no. He was vitally involved in their problems so much that their problems moved him to tears. Moved him to tears. This is exactly what Paul says in Romans 12. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, right? There have been times where I've rejoiced with counselees and there have been times where I have cried with counselees. That's not some kind of Skinnerian, white coat, clinical approach to counseling where people are but animals and they need just behavioral changes. That's not it at all. That's not what we're about. We're talking about working with real people who have souls, who are made in the image of their Redeemer. They're not animals. So he went about for three years, nuthotewing, I just made up a word, nuthotewing, each one with tears. That's Paul's personal ministry of the Word of God. So you can see how important this is. Let's go over to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 14. He concludes the book of Romans with this amazing statement. And he says in verse 14, And concerning you, my brethren, he's speaking to the Roman church, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness. Now, he's not talking about internal goodness, but goodness in the way that they treated one another. They're full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and enabled also, here we are, to nuthateo one another. There's our word. To warn, admonish, or counsel. They were able to counsel one another. This is what Paul didn't just do himself. This is not just something that he admonished the elders of the church to do. He's addressing the entire church here. He's saying, I've trained you. Uh, the leaders in your church have trained you. Now you need to get busy counseling one another with the Word of God. Ministering the Word of God to others that are hurting in the church. Now let's go over to Colossians 1.28. You can see it on the screen. Colossians 1.28. Here Paul again talks about his own personal ministry and sets up his ministry as the model to be followed. Paul here says, uh, we proclaim him, admonishing, there's our word, nuthatao again, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Now, what's repeated three times in that verse? Every man. The emphasis is not upon groups of people. The in emphasis is upon individuals. Teaching every man admonishing every man so that he can present every man complete in Christ. Paul said, that was my ministry. And that's exactly the kind of ministry you're supposed to have in the church. No doubt Paul was admonishing and teaching every man to counter the false teaching and to deal with personal struggles and difficulties that they were facing and that early church there at Colossae faced. So let me ask you a question. What do you do when a member of your congregation is caught in adultery? You say, oh, you better go see the pastor. 
Hmm. Or they're having fits of anger. Remember, we had a man in our church, he was a carpenter several years ago. He never hit his wife, never hit his kids, but if you looked at all the interior doors of his house, they all had holes in them, hollow core doors. He'd get mad at them, and, or he'd just get mad and take it out on the door. Boom! Hole in the door. I remember once in counseling, I said to him, Gary, do you know, Jesus said, I am the door. <laughs> he got the point. Taking it out on doors. What do you do when somebody has fits of anger? Or somebody's extremely fearful. They're controlled by fear. They're afraid to go to this place, or they're afraid to see this person, or they're afraid to be confronted about something, or they're afraid to do something that they know that they ought to be doing, but they're not doing. What do you do when you see somebody who's in that situation? Or somebody who's really anxious? Or somebody severely depressed in your congregation? How will you help them? It's a critical question. Will you take your instruction from the world, or are you going to take your instruction from the infallible Word of God? Where are you going to get that instruction? How are you going to help them? Now, there's a fourth thing. When we're talking about this, I want you to understand that biblical counseling is not an entity separate from discipleship. That's the reason why we call it the Biblical Counseling and Discipleship Association of Southern California. It's not separate from discipleship. Discipleship is kind of a broad term, and we use it broadly. In fact, you can, if you do a word study on discipleship throughout the New Testament, you'll find out it's a very broad term to speak of all kinds of teaching that went on in the early church and, and the learning and modeling of certain truths. And in discipleship, often when a person comes to Christ, they go in a fundamentals of the faith class or a discipleship class to teach them some of the basics and fundamentals of the faith. Counseling is a subset of discipleship. It's very targeted discipleship. In other words, counseling really is targeted on specific problems that people are having that they've tried to work on those problems and by themselves they have not been able to deal with that problem or even through their own study of the Word of God they've not found any resolution to that problem and so they need someone to come alongside in a Galatians 6-1 sense and help them. If you study carefully the early church, this is exactly what happened. Paul sets himself up as a good illustration of this. He, he led them to Christ. You can see this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Um, and then he led them to Christ's likeness by loving them, by admonishing them, by setting an example for them to model in terms of righteousness and holiness, by teaching them, by reproducing them, and discipling them when necessary. All of that is there. We're talking about following that model. When people need discipleship in a broad sense, then we give them discipleship. When they need counseling to focus on specific struggles that they're having with depression or anxiety or interpersonal relationships or struggles in their marriage or struggles with parenting, again, the source and our authority is the infallible Word of God. That's our source. That's what we're going to go to. That's what we're after. And then we would say this, that biblical counseling is not an activity that is insensitive or uncaring. You don't say to people, take two verses and call me in the morning. That's not the approach. No, you can tell from even Paul's example on how their problems and their struggles in life moved him to tears in a similar way you need to get, get so involved with those people and 
they know that you're involved in their life and that you care for them. We'll talk about that later on this weekend. You care for them so much that their problems and as well as their joys move you. Moves you. We're preoccupied with everything else. Several years ago, I'll never forget, one day I was out making a call in people's homes late one night, and I got home and um, walked in the house, and usually the family was in the kitchen at that particular time when they weren't there, and I didn't know where they were, and I heard some noise coming back from the den area of the house, and so I made my way back in there, and as I walked into the den, people were sitting around on couches, and they were all in tears. And you know, when you see a scene like that, instantly a thousand things go through your mind. And, oh man, something devastating has happened. Somebody's been in an accident. Somebody's died suddenly. You could tell they were just in anguish. And as I walked in the den a little bit further to ask them what's going on, I noticed they were watching television. They were watching the Waltons. Do you remember the Waltons? <laughs> and this was an episode, maybe you remember it. It was an episode where... Um, well, actually, in the previous episode, the way I'm, I have been told it, Mary Ellen had just recently got married, and right after she was married, her husband was shipped off in the military. So she hasn't seen him for a long time, and all of a sudden, the postman comes up to the little farm and uh, the screen door on the front of that farmhouse and knocks on it. Mary Ellen, you got a letter. Mary Ellen comes running down from upstairs, and everybody in the household comes running around, and she grabs it from the postman. She can tell it has a military stamp on it, and so she's really excited, and she rips that thing open and starts to read it, and it's from the Department of Defense telling her that her husband has been killed at Pearl Harbor. And they were sitting there, oh, I can't believe this. After all this time, and she waited. Now, we have the capacity to do that with television programs, with books that we read, with theatrical presentations we see. Why don't we do that with one another? The issue is not our capacity. The issue is whether or not we do it. We have that capacity. The Apostle Paul, did. this is what the early church did. They were so involved. So biblical counseling is not an activity that's insensitive and caring. Not at all. It's very caring. It's focused on the fact that first and foremost, we as counselors are humble. And because we're humble, we're going to be gentle with where people are at. Biblical counseling is done in a caring way. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, Paul says he worked with people like a caring parent. It's not throwing Bible verses around haphazardly. Be warm and be feel, filled, as James warns us not to do in James chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. You need to care about people when you're ministering the Word of God to them. You need to pray for them, and you need to counsel them in love, and you need to allow their problems to move you. You say, okay, that's what biblical counseling is not. What is it? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Number one, biblical counseling discerns desires, thinking, and behavior that God wants to change. As we saw in Colossians 1, 28, it's designed to help your counselee to become complete, to become mature, and to ultimately become more like Christ. In verse 29, Paul says, he worked to the point of exhaustion. He labored. And the Greek word translated striving is where we get our English word to agonize. He agonized with them. And all along, Paul says, striving according to his power, which so mightily, mightily works within me. And the results spiritually and the results eternally are done by God through Paul and through us. So what is it? 
We're talking about discerning desires and thinking and behavior that God wants to change. That's addressing the whole person. And it uses the Word of God by the Holy Spirit to change those desires, thinking, and behavior. The Word of God is the chief diagnostic tool. The Word of God is also the remedy, the change agent used by the Holy Spirit in the life of people where they really change internally, inside out. We're not looking to have people artificially follow the Word of God, and we're going to learn this a little bit later, that all counseling is pre-counseling until a person comes to Christ. You cannot counsel an unbeliever. You can't do it. The only thing the Bible says we can do with an unbeliever is evangelize them, but you can't counsel them. Now, that doesn't mean I won't spend some time with an unbeliever, but I'm always going to bring them back to the gospel. Why? Because the Word of God for the unbeliever at best is a set of suggestions, at best. And even if you did get them to obey the Word of God and what the Word of God says about their particular problem, what have you made them into? A Pharisee. That's exactly right. They're doing it externally. They're not doing it from the standpoint of a changed heart. All counseling is pre-counseling until a person comes to Christ. So we have to evangelize them. Now, Will I do good to an unbeliever? Sure, I will do good. That unbeliever needs some help, I'll provide them with a little bit of help. But I'm always going to bring it around to the gospel. I may spend three or four weeks with an unbeliever. But if I see that they're not really interested in change, they're not interested in the gospel at all, then I'm casting pearls before swine. I'm going to give them every opportunity to let them know that I care for them and I care about their problem. But there comes a point at which I believe when you study the life of Christ, Jesus moved with the movers. I can't force the gospel down their throat. That would not be proper for me to do. So I'm going to go to a person who is willing to receive the truth of the Word of God. So, biblical counseling uses the Word of God by the Holy Spirit to change those desires and that thinking and behavior. Third, biblical counseling seeks the sanctification of the Christian into Christ's likeness for the glory of God. That's what we're after. We're after Christ-likeness. And every Christian understands that. Every Christian understands that. Several years ago, Jay Adams went to the International Association of Psychiatrists and Psychologists in Berlin, Germany, their annual meeting. He was invited to come. They wanted to hear, what is this new thing, biblical counseling? And so he was able to address an audience of about a 1,000 of them. And he got up and he said to them, he said, uh, there's one thing that all counseling has in common. We all are looking for people to change. But he said, the difference between you and me is that you cannot agree what you want people to change into. You go from one psychiatrist to another psychiatrist, and, that, and you're going to get a different opinion on what you want people to come into or change into. One of them's a behaviorist. One of them is a family system therapist. Another one is a scenarianist. Another one is a Neo-Freudian. Uh, whatever it is, they can't agree. But there's one thing that all Christians understand intuitively. When, they, when we get done with them, we want them to be more like... You understand that. We're seeking change into Christ's likeness. That's what we're after. That doesn't necessarily mean that all their problems are going to go away, but they're going to be Christ-like in dealing with those problems. So, we want to say this, that biblical counseling then is nuthetic. Biblical counseling is nuthetic. It's, that word nuthetic is an interesting word because it is actually the combination of a noun and a verb. The noun is nous, which means mind. The verb is tithemi, and, you put, and that means to place or to put. So you stick them together, and you have to place or put, the idea is, sense into the mind. That's nuthetetic. This is to place or to put 
sense into the mind. That's what we're after. Here are the following references. Acts chapter 20 and verse 31, Romans 15, 14, 1 Corinthians 4, 14, Colossians 1, 28, Colossians 3, 16, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and 5, 14, 2 Thessalonians 3, 15. You can see the way it's translated in the King James, New American Standard, and the New International Version. Admonish, warn, instruct. The idea here is to place or to put sense back into the mind. That is biblical sense. And the mind becomes the key thing. And we'll talk about that later on. Because the mind is that part of man that becomes the control center. Sometimes the Bible refers to that mind as the heart. I know when we think of heart, we think of something radically different. But when the Bible or the Hebrew concept of heart, it's not prom primarily emotions. The Hebrew concept of the heart is primarily that of thinking, expectations, purposing, as a man purposes in his heart, Proverbs says. So is he. It has to do with our intentionality. It has to do with our desires. As a man purposes and desires and plans, how does he do that? He does that with the heart, the Bible says, which at the very core of the biblical concept of heart is how a man thinks about his life, the sense that he brings to his life, his environment, his circumstances. And this is why we call biblical counseling neuthetic. Neuthetic. To place or to put sense into the mind. Now, I wish we had time with as large a group as we have here this evening. I would love to be able to sit down with every one of you and get to know where you're coming from, but I can't do that. But there's one thing that I want you to think about as you go through the sessions tonight, tomorrow, and in the couple of months ahead. I want you to think about, is my practice and my idea of ministry conformed to the New Testament model. And if it is, then I'm going to be willing to help people. I'm going to be willing to give myself to individual people that are struggling in my church, in my congregation, and to help them with the Word of God as I learn how to use the Word of God, not just to dispense it, but to minister it in very practical ways to people that are hurting. That's what we're after. I started with the story of that man who came into counseling. And let me end there. I saw God radically change that couple. And they actually, at the end of that counseling, was able to go back to their home church and go back. He was able to go back to his company he was able to go back to his family and back into his community and actually use this as an occasion to humbly admit his wrong and his sin and to talk about how Jesus Christ, through his grace, had radically changed his desires. He used that as an occasion to point to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and his transforming power. And that's what people can do whom you minister the Word of God to. That's what we hope you will do in the ministry of the Word of God. So that's our beginning. We want to start there. 